Wow, what a wonderful gathering. Many thanks to Burnsville High School and Carla Staff and all the others around the high school who have, and the school district who have put this together. It was a very exciting moment for me. Uh, before I get into my remarks, I, I have a confession to make. In the last 40 years, I must say, I've never had a real job. I've been following an idea. And that's good and it's bad. And it's bad because I guess I, I can never really retire then. <laughs> If, if my brain's still working. Um, for me, the, the notion of, of what it means to be fully human involves a combination of growing up, acquiring information, knowledge, skills, but it also means the ability and the opportunity to contribute to others. The idea of contribution, the idea of giving back, is something that Viktor Frankl, in his classic work, Man's Search for Meaning, highlighted. He, a Holocaust survivor, found in the experience of people contributing in the, that horrible experience, the notion that, of meaning and purpose. There is something very special in our DNA that says, to be whole, we not only have to receive and to know, but we have to contribute. So that's kind of been my journey. That is not Minnesota. <laughs> that's that's the, demilitar the edge of the demilitarized zone in South Korea, where I started my tour of duty as an infantry officer with the 2nd Infantry. While there, I came to appreciate the fact that it's really important to be in a context with people of different races and cultures if you are, in fact, wanting to reach a shared goal. And so, in Korea, I learned about the, the idea of service. But service, in, in the context of the military, was not something that I wanted to pursue for much longer. In fact, since then, I've become a pacifist and really believe that there's got to be another way to contribute beyond the military. I began studying the works of people who, who had thought about it, this, this idea much more than I had. The philosopher William James in 1910 wrote the seminal essay on the topic of the moral equivalent of war, something that needed to happen in the lives of people growing up that did not involve violence. That idea was carried forward by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932 when he founded the, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Over, over three million men, unemployed, brought to work in, largely in the forests and what now have become the state par parks around the country and national parks. How many of you know of someone who was in the CCC or been to a park and seen one of those structures? I've seen many of them. My father was a part of the CCC. And then you move forward in terms of, of national program models, like the Peace Corps, John F. Kennedy, 1961. And that, too, inspired many Americans to service. More recently, we have the AmeriCorps VISTA model. Again, a full-time service experience for people largely out of high school. But what about the people who don't uh, have the opportunity for full-time service? or don't want to be involved in, in something that takes them away from home. What about that, the vast numbers of people growing up? And that's, that's taken me uh, to schools. And in this case, in the, in the late 1970s, I was asked to go to St. Louis to work with a group of people who were very concerned about what was happening in terms of racial integration and forced busing. There was a lot of challenge in St. Louis at the time. And so we created a, a, uh, a summer school model where high school students, black and white, came together to, to become instructional aides with young people from the city who were involved in, in learning. Basic math, 
basic science, basic reading. Young people as tutors and mentors, very effective model. And there, I got my mind blown because I met Derek. Derek. Derek Jackson. Derek Jackson was about 6'2". He'd gone to Cardoza High School. He's a volunteer that summer. He was really into working with young kids. He was great. He was charismatic. They loved him. He was in an aerobic training session, getting ready to do aerobics with the younger children the next week when the, when the program was starting. And so Derek was out there. He was doing it. And then he stopped. And he walked off the gymnasium floor and walked right by me. I followed him. Derek, what's going on? You've got to learn this stuff. He said, oh, my leg hurts. Oh, come on, Derek. You're, you're a tight end on the team. You know, you can, you can handle being kicked in aerobics a little bit, can't you? Kidding him. He said, my leg really does hurt. And he bent down and pulled up his, his leg and showed me his calf and the bullet hole and the blood streaming out of his leg. His leg really did hurt. And as we were driving to the hospital, Derek, why didn't you say something when you came in this morning? You'd been on a city bus for an hour to get here. You'd given up a lot of other job opportunities to be a part of this. Why didn't you say something? He said, I think the young people, I think those kids need me. I think they need me. It's at that point in time, I began rethinking, along with many other people in the late 70s and early 80s, the idea of positive youth development, the notion of not looking at young people as deficits, people that need to be fixed, but people who need to be engaged as contributors, people who have something to offer. I also began thinking about learning and how we teach and how instruction happens. At the top of the learning pyramid is the most common way of instruction. What I would be doing if, if this hall was full of people, the lecture method. The most efficient way uh, before the internet of delivering information. One person, one source, an audience sitting back, taking notes and perhaps responding nominally. That's the most efficient way of delivering information. But as you increase the levels of engagement, you bring in some audiovisual, some discussion, some particip participation, and you get down to the bottom of the pyramid, you find people like Derek, people who are teaching others. The old saying, if you learn, teach, and then you will really learn, I think really holds true. It was at that notion of learning and teaching that I bumped into and spent some time with uh, middle school students in Henderson, Minnesota, the New Country School. The New Country School in the early 90s was very much involved in exploration of the local ponds and doing surveys of amphibians in those ponds. It was a basic science, experiential learning, form of engaged learning activity. But what did they find? And they brought this information back home to the classroom. They said, why are all these frogs having extra legs? What's going on with these frogs? And they went back and they studied some more. And, and people said, well, you know, we don't know what's going on. They raised the question with their teacher and their principal and their legislator. And pretty soon there was a hearing in the Minnesota legislature about the fact that there was not only frogs deformed in Henderson, Minnesota because of some mystery chemical, but it was happening throughout the state of Minnesota. Young people raised an issue, an important issue, and people responded to them. So the combination then of rethinking the role of young people in society, assets and resources, combined with what we know about engaged learning, experiential, experiential education with a giving dimension, what we call service learning, became what I was a part of 
at the National Youth Leadership Council for almost 30 years. I'm joined by people now in every state in about 30 countries who are very much involved and invested in what we call service learning, engaged learning with a giving dimension. In Minnesota, we began convening groups of students, talking about what they could do when they, we brought this information back home. We, there was a multiplier effect in that there was state legislation with state funding, there was a state commission, there was state curricula, there was a whole manner, all manner of activities that went along with what we did in the state, and then it multiplied. We had a national service learning conference here in Minnesota. Myself and two other states said, well, let's get together and talk and we'll call it a national conference. <laughs> and sure enough, we did in 1989 and it's been going on for almost uh, 26 years now. Well, the point is that there are many places where young people are, are needed and can contribute and it can be tied to the curriculum. And that's why I'm here today is because I think we can't possibly replicate AmeriCorps to the level that it would reach all three million graduates of American high schools. We can't do it. We don't have the capacity. Where service and, and contribution can join learning can happen in the schools. And it can happen at any number of, of grade levels. You see some examples here where young people are making a contribution. You can find service learning literally at every age level at, in every subject area in the curriculum, K-12 and on to higher education. Over 40 campuses in Minnesota are actively involved in Minnesota Campus Compact, committed to service learning. 1,200 campuses across the, the, the states now, more than 1,200 involved in active service and service learning. Well, these are great ideas. It's tough getting it together. We all know extending the classroom is, is very hard. But I think we, we can draw inspiration from people who have gone before us. In particular, I would cite Dr. King, who said everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Kindergartners, second graders, middle school people, Juniors, seniors, college students, people a little older, we can contribute. What did he By have to say? That definition. Nineteen sixty eight, four months before he was killed. I didn't see his presentation in, in, at the uh, at the church in Atlanta, but I've listened to his sermon and many others along the same line. And unfortunately I watched his funeral procession in Washington in nineteen sixty eight as it went by and felt with everybody that we had lost something. But we haven't lost all of Dr. King, and we haven't lost all of Gandhi, and we haven't lost all of the major inspirations in our lives, from Christ to Buddha, who, said, who have said that to be fully human, it means not only to be a, an effective individual in terms of your skill set, but part of fully human means to be a contributor, 
to mean, it means to be able to give back. Derek Jackson taught me that. Many excellent teachers who are now involved in service learning are teaching me this. I would challenge you as teachers to think about how young people not only can take in and learn, but how they can contribute. They will join a vast audience of people in every state. Google Missouri, service learning. You'll find a whole list of people. Montana, service learning. Taiwan, service learning. Singapore, service learning. It's out there, and we need to support it. We're never going to get everybody into full-time service activities. But we can start, and we can start now. Thanks for being a part of it.